Hi, I'm Jack Schmidling. And I'm Marilyn Shank. Before you head off to Africa in search of exotic wildlife, we'd like to show you what can be found right in your own backyard. So why don't you join us on our backyard safari? The typical backyard with its short grass and cement patio may be a great place for a barbecue, but it is basically a human habitat where little else can survive but crabgrass and dandelions. As the human population grows and spreads its short grass and concrete across the face of the earth, wildlife species are forced onto a smaller and smaller share of the planet. When city meets city, the inevitable result is extinction. We can all help slow down this annihilation of nature's treasures by sharing our backyards with what little wildlife is left. Your contribution can be anything from a simple bird bath to a dedicated nature sanctuary. The easiest wildlife to attract to a backyard are birds for the simple reason that their ability to fly allows them to move freely from one food source to another. This young blue jay seems to be contemplating his next meal. The best way to attract birds is with a feeding station. A simple tray elevated above the ground supplied with bird seed will produce visitors almost immediately. House sparrows and morning doves are usually the first arrivals to a new bird feeder. Bird feeders are particularly important in winter because of the shortage of natural food available in urbanized areas. A piece of suet is a welcome treat for insect eating birds that have a difficult time finding food in winter. Even this pair of sparrowhawks became regular visitors to another feeder supplied with meat scraps. They came several times each day throughout the winter, but disappeared after mating in spring. There's much more to the sparrowhawk story, but we'll get to that later. Scavengers such as crows can be attracted to table scraps of all sorts. 
These are the largest birds likely to be found in urban areas and are probably the most difficult to gain the confidence of. They are extremely wary birds and getting this footage took about two months of frustration. The sound of the camera running inside the house was enough to scare them away. In addition to the basic bird seed feeder, thistle seed feeders will attract birds that specialize in these very tiny seeds. This pair of purple finches became regular visitors to this feeder. Another feeder that seems to be more wishful thinking than practical is the hummingbird feeder. In the five years since we started thinking natural in our yard, I have seen one hummingbird, but that was enough to encourage us to put up the feeder. It is designed to look like a bright red flower and contains artificial flower nectar. This is a mixture of sugar, water, and a little red food coloring. Occasionally, a bird will defy all conventions and eat in very unlikely places. A pair of cardinals made their table on the headrest of a lawn chair. It started one day when I noticed the male eating a grape there, and so we started placing sunflower seeds on the headrest. That was three years ago, and they are now so tame that they will call from a nearby tree if there are no seeds out and return many times each day. One thing to keep in mind regarding feeders is that most small birds don't like to feed out in the open because of the instinctive fear of predators such as hawks and cats. Small trees and shrubs within a few feet of the feeder will provide them with the necessary cover. One of the more interesting birds of the city is the American kestrel. This falcon is one of the few birds of prey to actually thrive in an urban environment. This particular bird came to us the hard way. It was found flopping around in the yard with the mother shrieking at it from the telephone wire. When it became obvious that the bird had a problem, we examined it and found that it had a broken leg and would not survive without human intervention. After setting the leg to immobilize it, she was able to perch well enough to rest and eat. A falcon requires two good legs for survival. They typically capture and kill their prey by swooping down on them and grasping it with both talons with enough force to kill it almost instantly. While eating, they perch on one foot and hold the prey with the other. When she was able to grasp a mealworm in her talons, we knew that things were looking up. It was very gratifying when she was able to hold on to my finger with both feet so well that it caused pain. When eating something large like these chicken scraps, they hold the food in both talons while tearing away pieces of food with the beak. The natural diet of this bird, also known as a sparrowhawk, consists of small birds and large insects. After about eight weeks, she was placed outside in a cage to get her used to the climate. I would like to point out here that birds of prey are protected by law, and a permit from your conservation department is required to keep one for any reason, including rehabilitation. Finally, one wonderful day, she was released to resume her life in the wild.
After resting a few moments, she took off in an upward spiraling flight and we assumed we had seen the last of her. Meanwhile, we decided that our tired old garage occupied space that could be better utilized by wildlife. So with a little uncertainty, we had it torn down and hauled away. This may sound like a radical thing to do, but as this condition was a bit of a neighborhood eyesore anyway, we solved two problems at one time. It also provided the incentive to do a little house cleaning. Very little of what was being stored in the garage was worth storing in the house and ended up in the trash where it should have been long ago. A 17 by 17 foot garage may not seem as though it would provide much additional space, but for a typical small urban lot, it represents about one fifth of the available space. The centerpiece of our plan for this space is to be a small pond. Filling the gap in the fence was all that remained of the job. A fence serves two very important purposes in a natural backyard. First of all, it keeps out dogs, children, and to some extent discourages cats. Secondly, it is usually easier to hide a natural yard from unreasonable neighbors than to fight the universal belief that grass longer than three inches is unkempt and adversely affects property values. The best way to furnish both cover and food for birds and many other forms of wildlife is to plant native shrubs and trees. The flowers will attract many interesting species of insects. The flower nectar will provide food for insects and hummingbirds. The fruits, berries, and seeds supply hassle-free food for many species of birds. Marilyn is planting some wild elderberry bushes. The wine made from elderberries is legendary but we are going to forego the pleasure and leave them for the birds. Up to 40 species of songbirds are known to favor the elderberry. These bushes will get up to 13 feet high and just about as wide and will provide extensive cover for birds in addition to hiding places for numerous small animals. We planted five elderberry bushes spaced evenly along the fence. Trees, of course, are very important for bird roosting and nesting. For those of us not fortunate enough to have a yard blessed with trees, it is never too soon to plant them. This cottonwood is a fast-growing native species that was transplanted from a railroad right-of-way. Most of these are tiny crustaceans, commonly called water fleas. This crustacean is called a cyclops because it seems to have only one eye. This particular one is a female with two large sacks full of eggs. These somewhat unwelcome guests are mosquito larvae from a rain barrel. The tadpoles and dragonfly larvae seem to keep them under control in the pond as we never found any in there. This interesting plant is called a bladderwort. 
It is a carnivorous plant that utilizes small bladders to trap tiny organisms and digest them in a manner similar to the Venus flytrap. Probably the most fascinating organism in the pond is the hydra. The hydra is a freshwater relative of coral and jellyfish. They capture prey by paralyzing it with poisonous stinger cells on the tentacles. If these two appear to be stuck together, that's because they are. The hydra reproduces by a process known as budding. A new hydra simply starts to grow out of the parent. A safari just would not be complete without a night walk. There are many things that can be seen at no other time. For example, the moonflower opens up at dusk to be pollinated by night flying insects and closes when the sun comes up. We are going to follow Marilyn on a walk around the yard. Here she found the larva of a hawk moth munching away on lilac leaves. This larva is also called a hornworm because of the horn-like projection on the posterior end. This flower is called bee balm, not only because of the interest bees show in feeding on the nectar, but at night, just about every blossom has a bee sleeping on it. Hot, humid summer nights bring out the garden slugs. Superficially, slugs look like snails without shells. But upon close observation, they clearly have shells, but they just happen to be soft. We felt like proud parents when we found a toad from last year's tadpoles. Because our tadpoles of this spring won't be singing frogs until next spring, we have taken the liberty of cutting in some footage of an adult cricket frog, which we shot when collecting the tadpoles. You'll also hear a bullfrog calling in the background. The most common night sounds in our backyard are crickets. The high-pitched singing is the snowy tree cricket. The other is the more common field cricket. This is what the tree cricket looks like up close. And this is a field cricket carefully cleaning his antenna. By the way, only the male cricket sings. The female can also be identified by the long ovipositor at the posterior end.
Another flower that opens up at night is the evening primrose. A patch of water on the sidewalk has attracted a large gathering of millipedes. We saved our favorite night visitor for last. Late summer brings us our first frogs. This little fellow is a pickerel frog. And this is our bullfrog. The elderberries are ripening. The grapes are not quite as far along, but that doesn't seem to bother this chafing beetle munching on the leaves. What caught my attention about this beetle was his fascinating antenna. Another insect emerging at this time is a cyclical cicada, in this case a 17-year locust. Some of the flowers blooming in late summer are the New England aster, the water plantain, and the mullen. The purple cone flower is representative of a family of flowers known as Asteraceae, or star flowers. What appears to be a flower is just a showy facade to attract insects to the very tiny true flowers. With the arrival of fall come the migratory birds like the chickadees, warblers, and juncos. Fall is also the time for mushrooms. They can be found under evergreens, on logs, in the grass, or on the compost heap. And on a much smaller scale, on a moldy apple. The tiny fruiting bodies disperse spores just like the larger mushrooms. Our mushroom garden is under the stairs in the basement. When we find a log or a piece of wood on which mushrooms are growing, we place them in here and many of them come back year after year. This one is called a honeycomb mushroom because of the structure of the spore producing area.
These are called inky caps, and this time-lapse sequence shows what happens within a period of about 48 hours. The mushroom emerges, ripens, and digests itself into an ink-like substance containing the spores. Rainfall disperses the spores to a new location. Fall leads us inevitably to winter, which brings us to the end of our safari and finds us counting the days till the first sign of spring. But before we leave you, I would like to call your attention to the Backyard Wildlife Sanctuary Program sponsored by the National Wildlife Federation. After submitting a simple form that lists your backyard contributions to wildlife, they will send you an official registered certificate. This is not only a source of great personal pride, but if posted in a conspicuous place, will show the neighbors that you are serious about doing your share to help what little wildlife is left. Thank you for joining us, and bon voyage. Now that the work is done, it is time to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Our backyard safari begins with a trip through the seasons as we find Maryland searching for the first sign of life after the prairie burn in spring. The May apple is one of the first plants to come up in the woodland plot. This is how our hummingbird flower, the jewelweed, starts out life. One of the first flowers to bloom is the spring cress. This one is called bloodroot, so named because of the red juice it excretes when a stem or root is cut. To many, the spring beauty is a true harbinger of spring. Higher up, the raspberry is just starting to leaf out. Higher still, the maple trees are in full bloom. Flowers of trees are easy to overlook when they are not real conspicuous, but most of them are very interesting and easy to study when the trees are still small. The birch tree has two separate flowers. The male flower produces the pollen, and the female flower produces the seed. When seen at close range, the male flower is actually rather bizarre. The Norway maple requires a very close look. What appears to be a tree leafing out is actually a tree in full bloom with flowers that happen to be green. But no one is likely to miss apple blossom time. In the Midwest, the first robin is one sure sign of spring. The first birds to nest are the neighborhood crows. The squirrel is feasting on the newly laid pecan trail. 
and has found a rather interesting place to eat his gleanings. By late April, the May apple is displaying flower buds. The rue anemone is blooming, as is the marsh marigold. One of the most elegant flowers of spring is the white trillium. Over in the marsh, the cattails and water plantain are emerging. And an alga called zygnema is beginning to spread over the surface of the water. The month of May brings with it a flush of green, more flowers, and the return and rebirth of the insect population. The prairie plants are bursting forth. The two-foot leaves of the skunk cabbage are well on the way. Strictly an option in the backyard, the poison ivy is growing vigorously. Some of the flowers that appear at this time of the year are the white-eyed grass, the wild geranium, and flocks. The first insects to show up are the bumblebees and butterflies. Backyard wildlife will show up in some of the strangest places. A clutch of spider eggs hatched out in the bag where we store aluminum cans. Over near the pond, a wasp is gathering mud for a nest. Clearly, not just any mud will do. But when the right kind is found, it is rolled into a perfect ball and carried away. In the water, the tadpoles are developing rapidly. We are going to take one inside to get a closer look. In the bottom view, we can actually see the food working its way through the intestines. By early summer, our nature sanctuary is really starting to look like one. The elderberry bushes are finally in bloom. What looks like snow in summer is just the flower petals falling to the ground and leaving the fertilized ovaries to mature into fruit.
Some of the other flowers of this season are the garden coreopsis and the black-eyed Susan. Green cone flowers and white clover. Queen Anne's lace and crown vetch. Daylilies, morning glories, and swamp milkweed. Insects are also very abundant at this time of year. Just leaving a piece of apple out for a few hours presents a real photo opportunity. While inspecting milkweeds for monarch eggs, I came across this interesting egg supported on a long stalk, presumably to keep it out of the reach of predators that crawl over the leaves looking for eggs. After about three days, the egg was empty and this larva was found eating the leaf. In about a week, it pupated in a cocoon from which finally emerged an insect known as a lacewing. Well, it now appears that the hole under the fence has been discovered. Although our bunny seems to be a very fussy eater, selecting only the most nutritious of plants, he is really a junk food junkie at heart. Our visiting chipmunk seems to have the same preference. The mice, on the other hand, really do seem to prefer cheese. At the pond, female dragonflies are laying eggs.
During the egg laying, a male guards his territory to make sure that only he fertilizes the females at his pond. Bringing a dragonfly inside, we can get a good look at his compound eyes and appreciate the complexity and delicacy of the wing. This is the ovipositor, or egg-laying, apparatus. The tadpoles are right on schedule. The leopard frogs have all their legs and are beginning to lose their tails. Although larger in bulk, the bullfrogs have a lot of growing up to do. While filming the mud dauber wasp, we noticed a lot of activity on a much smaller scale. So he brought some pond water samples into the lab to get a closer look. Most of these are tiny crustaceans, commonly called water fleas. This crustacean is called a cyclops because it seems to have only one eye. This particular one is a female with two large sacks full of eggs. These somewhat unwelcome guests are mosquito larvae from a rain barrel. The tadpoles and dragonfly larvae seem to keep them under control in the pond, as we never found any in there. This interesting plant is called a bladderwort. It is a carnivorous plant that utilizes small bladders to trap tiny organisms and digest them in a manner similar to the Venus flytrap. Probably the most fascinating organism in the pond is the hydra. The hydra is a freshwater relative of coral and jellyfish. They capture prey by paralyzing it with poisonous stinger cells on the tentacles. If these two appear to be stuck together, that's because they are. The hydra reproduces by a process known as budding. A new hydra simply starts to grow out of the parent. The safari just would not be complete without a night walk. There are many things that can be seen at no other time. For example, the moonflower opens up at dusk to be pollinated by night flying insects and closes when the sun comes up. We are going to follow Marilyn on a walk around the yard. Here she found the larva of a hawk moth munching away on lilac leaves. This larva is also called a hornworm because of the horn-like projection on the posterior end. This flower is called bee balm, not only because of the interest bees show in feeding on the nectar, 
But at night, just about every blossom has a bee sleeping on it. Hot, humid summer nights bring out the garden slugs. Superficially, slugs look like snails without shells. But upon close observation, they clearly have shells, but they just happen to be soft. We felt like proud parents when we found a toad from last year's tadpoles. Because our tadpoles of this spring won't be singing frogs until next spring, we have taken the liberty of cutting in some footage of an adult cricket frog which we shot when collecting the tadpoles. You'll also hear a bullfrog calling in the background. The most common night sounds in our backyard are crickets. The high-pitched singing is the snowy tree cricket. The other is the more common field cricket. This is what the tree cricket looks like up close. And this is a field cricket carefully cleaning his antenna. By the way, only the male cricket sings. The female can also be identified by the long ovipositor at the posterior end. Another flower that opens up at night is the evening primrose. A patch of water on the sidewalk has attracted a large gathering of millipedes. We saved our favorite night visitor for last. Late summer brings us our first frogs. This little fellow is a pickerel frog. And this is our bullfrog. The elderberries are ripening. The grapes are not quite as far along, but that doesn't seem to bother this chafing beetle munching on the leaves. What caught my attention about this beetle was his fascinating antenna. Another insect emerging at this time is a cyclical cicada, in this case a 17-year locust. Some of the flowers blooming in late summer are the New England aster, the water plantain, and the mullen.
The purple cone flower is representative of a family of flowers known as Asteraceae, or star flowers. What appears to be a flower is just a showy facade to attract insects to the very tiny true flowers. With the arrival of fall come the migratory birds like the chickadees, warblers, and juncos. Fall is also the time for mushrooms. They can be found under evergreens, on logs, in the grass, or on the compost heap. And on a much smaller scale, on a moldy apple. The tiny fruiting bodies disperse spores just like the larger mushrooms. Our mushroom garden is under the stairs in the basement. When we find a log or a piece of wood on which mushrooms are growing, we place them in here and many of them come back year after year. This one is called a honeycomb mushroom because of the structure of the spore producing area. These are called inky caps and this time lapse sequence shows what happens within a period of about 48 hours. The mushroom emerges, ripens and digests itself into an ink like substance containing the spores. Rainfall disperses the spores to a new location. Fall leads us inevitably to winter, which brings us to the end of our safari and finds us counting the days till the first sign of spring. But before we leave you, I would like to call your attention to the Backyard Wildlife Sanctuary Program sponsored by the National Wildlife Federation. After submitting a simple form that lists your backyard contributions to wildlife, they will send you an official registered certificate. This is not only a source of great personal pride, but if posted in a conspicuous place, will show the neighbors that you are serious about doing your share to help what little wildlife is left. Thank you for joining us, and bon voyage. Mm -hmm.